there's just so many elements of Bob Lazar's story that we have tracked down because I, you know, when it's if it's easily classified information um, on scientific level, right? Like the element one fifteen stuff. So that's the that's the real big scientific thing that he supposedly came out with, and and there's so many misconceptions about that as well that I'd like to spend a minute to clear up. Okay, so. The, the the key thing of Bob's story is the element 115, which he says is how the, the, the power source and, and the um, also the anti-gravity propulsion source for how these things fly. And he claimed, you know, he people claim he predicted it back in 1989. Um, there's lots of other people who predicted it, including, you know, back in the, six, the, the 1960s, the Glenn Seaborg knew that there was going to be elements up that high, you know, and he even predicted the element, the, the island of stability there. And there was actually an article that was published in Scientific American in May 1989, which is the exact month and year that Bob Lazar first came out with his story. And it's on page 68 of the May 1989 issue of Scientific American, and it's called Super Heavy Elements. And it talks about the island of stability in element 115. Um, but it, nowhere in any of this is any mention that it has anti-gravity properties or, you know, energy, you know, production properties. So that's mm. the, that's the big thing. We've discovered element 115 and people the, like mm. the, the core bells and everyone try to claim that that means that, you know, oh, it, it can, it, they've confirmed Bob Lazar's story because they, you know, he predicted it in, in, in 1989 and then they discovered it years later. So that confirmed his story. No, mm. it didn't. He, he, he claimed that there was a stable isotope. And that it, it had anti-gravity properties. Some some more records of his educational background, which he claims to have these degrees, advanced degrees, and have gone to these schools. Um, uh, which there is evidence, right? So the evidence came out, right? It's interesting because he had a court case in, in 1991, and on his court documents, he 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 stated that he had a his bachelor's degree was from Pacifica University, which is a correspondence university. And what year do you say this? It was shut down in in it was shut down in the early '90s as as being a degree mill. So this was like '91, I think, was the the conviction. So it was like two two years after he came out with the story. So this place called Pacifica was selling degrees, like yeah, selling. Okay, that's where he put. So the court case is interesting too because apparently, you know, he 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 had you know, become this whistleblower uh, about this big top secret program that he was hired to be this senior staff physicist on, and that um, you know. Afterwards, he, 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 he was, um, after, you know, two years later, he's running a brothel. He's literally running a brothel. That's what he gets. He, well, he wasn't, he wasn't running the brothel. He was, uh, there was a madame who was running the brothel. It was called the Crystal Cove. And his, he actually got arrested for um, setting up a CCTV camera system in the apartment complex. And he was, they were filming and blackmailing, you know, customers for, of, of the brothel. You is know. there proof that he tried to blackmail people? It's a court case. He pleaded guilty to it. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. You can look it up it. in Nevada. Yeah, you can look it up in Nevada. So it's there. And and um, there's a video of it online. And there's even videos of George Knapp talking about the incident, how he's like, he just, you know, brought this big scientist whistleblower out. And here goes the whole story because, you know... <laughs> Right. And, and apparently it didn't, it wasn't enough to make it go away. And a lot of people still don't know about that and that it happened, but mm -hmm. the court documents from that case, he lists his, he lists his degree was his bachelor's degree was from Pacifica university, not MIT or Caltech. He doesn't say that. And he says that his, um, uh, he had some, I don't know. He said something about university of Cal, Cal Northridge. I, I got to look up the, the documents from that court case, but it's on, it's on there. You can look it up. Uh, there's a whole website, um, Bob Lazar debunk.com where people can get like mm -hmm. a lot of these, um, documents and, and other stuff. And other researchers have done, uh, stuff on this too, including, a, a, an account on Twitter called signals Intel. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, there's not a lot of traction online with people that are trying to pick apart his story and like doing it successfully until I became aware of you that I really start to notice some of these details. Because, yeah, you know, people aren't looking for because the Bob Lazar story is such a fantastical story. It's awesome. I mean, that's what got me into researching UFOs and black projects and, and thinking the government has this stuff that that and, uh, you know, movies like Independence Day in, in 1997, where they have that scene where they go into the mm -hmm. underground hangar yeah. and it's, they say, oh, we got this from Roswell and all. So how from the time you first learned about Bob, how long did it take for you to start to question everything? 
I, I, I tend to question guys like Bob Lazar and, and especially that's, that's one of the main things is the education, the fact that he'd lie about being a physicist and, and having these credentials and then not being able to back it up. If you're a senior staff physicist, as I mentioned, uh, well, I didn't mention that. Let's, let's bring up Bernard Haish again, because I wanted to get into that. Um, Bernard Haish has what's called a CV or curriculum vitae. And that's what any, you know, published scientist is going to have uh, a bunch of work that they've worked on. Now, this guy was a senior staff physicist. He worked at Lockheed Martin Advanced Aerospace Concepts Department from 1979 to 1999. Talk more directly into that thing. Yeah, so 19 to 1999. And he worked on a bunch of classified physics programs as a senior staff physicist. And this is what you know, a real resume would look like for someone who would they'd recruit and hire to these types of programs. Mm -hmm. Bob Lazar does not have a CV. He claims to have a, um, a master's degree from MIT, and he claims that his thesis was in MHD or magnetohydrodynamics, which is a form of propulsion where, you know, it's like that when you ionize air and make it plasma and then use magnets to, to move that plasma. That's magnetohydrodynamics. Okay. So um, you can use it for propulsion and, you know, which is why he claimed that's what his degree was in, that that would give him credibility to have, you know, actually done the thing that he did or get the position out there, even though element 115 and the, the, the high-end, you know, nuclear physics is really a separate issue from magnetohydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a completely different fields, but, um, I don't know. It, you look at guys like this and you compare them to Bob Lazar and I'm like, well, you know, why would they hire Bob Lazar? You know, why would they need Bob Lazar when they have dudes like this working on this stuff? You know? Now, what did Bob Lazar say specifically about MIT? What did he say his level of education was at MIT? A master's degree. He said he had a master's degree. And at he MIT. said he graduated in 1982. Okay. Okay. Which was the same year that according to the Los Alamos Monitor article, he moved to Los Alamos from California. So if he was in Los Alamos, did he move to Los Alamos and then Los Alamos sent him to MIT? Because that's kind of like what what he changed the story up. Yeah, that's how he that's how he filled in like the holes in the timeline, saying that you know oh Los Alamos mm -hmm. sent him to this you know program to do a a speedy master's degree in MHD, which apparently never wrote a thesis paper for because there's no record of his thesis paper. That's what he says the government scrubbed, right? They tried to scrub everything out of his life. Right? How they could you how could you scrub that? It's it's published in journals and, and then other other you know, there's other scientists in that field who read every paper. If in if like if I'm in magnetohydrodynamics, if a new paper comes out on MHD, I'm reading it. And I'm be like, oh who's Robert Lazar? And you remember these things. So nobody's ever heard of him in the field. Mm -hmm. There's no record of his thesis, you know, anywhere. He didn't keep a copy of it you know there's none of that so so there's there's lots of things like that that are hard to say like well he says the government deleted all the records how could they delete you know every yearbook issued to every student who graduated in 1982 so there's no yearbook or anything like this there's, there's absolutely zero proof he was ever at mit yeah that's all it would take is a yearbook picture you know um, there's not a one class shred. listing there's no proof you know, and that's why Eric Weinstein recently, you know, I think he, he's starting to catch on because he challenged Bob Lazar to a debate. He said, well, Joe Rogan asked me if I'd debate Bob Lazar and he hadn't really looked into the story at the time, but I guess now he has and he's, you know, wants to, you know, get into the M MIT and phys what, what physics, you know, who, what physicists do you know? You know, because he was asked one time in 1993 in Rachel, Nevada, it was the last Q&A session that Bob Lazar ever gave publicly. And he was asked at that Q and A session by Tom Mahood, "Oh, you know, you claim that the government deleted your 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 educational records. You know, could you kind of could you try to reconstruct some of that history? Could you name you know some of your professors from Caltech or MIT?" He said, "Oh, sure. You know, I, I guess uh, you know Dr. Duxler and Dr. Hausenfelder is what Bob says in the interview." And uh, he says that Duxler was from Caltech and Hausenfelder was from MIT, and couldn't find anyone in the whole registry with that name. So Stanton looked up, you know, Duxler and the whole, you know, APS, you know, has all the, all the, any, anyone who's a physics teacher or student, you know, gets in, into the American Physical Society um, or APS and you're listed under there. I'm listed under there. You can look me up. And um, he looked up Duxler and found that there was one Professor Duxler who worked at Pierce Junior College in Woodland Hills, California, which is where um, Bob Lazar lived after high school, 
next to a uh, rocket engineer named Eugene Gluhareff, who actually built those rockets that he's on the bike, uh, the jet bike with. You know, he's got mm -hmm. the rocket bike and the rocket cars. So those are Gluhareff pressure jet engines. They're not actually rocket engines. They're extremely inefficient and extremely loud. And um, the um, yeah, so that that bike was built by his neighbor. He lived in Woodland Hills, California. That's where the articles from it talks about him. There, yeah. Yeah, Eugene Gluhareff, and he was a uh, a helicopter. Uh, he worked for Sikorsky Helicopters as well, so he's an interesting guy. And um, yeah, Bob Lazar lived in Woodland Hills, California. Went to Pierce Junior College, and there's dot. And then Stanton Friedman went and looked looked it up and found records that he actually attended classes there and, and asked Doctor Duxler to you know look in his records and said, mm -hmm. yeah, he did have a student you know by the name of Bob Lazar, Robert Lazar, in one of his classes. So. Yes, it, it's it's a fact that he did go to Pierce Junior College, and uh, if you can go to MIT and go to Caltech, you don't go to Pierce Junior College. Right, but what he says you don't go to community college if you get into MIT and Caltech. Right, but I think he claimed that he was sent to MIT by who by parts of the government, whoever he was working for it at okay. to to learn more about some of this technology that he was studying. That's what he I believe that he claimed. I could be wrong there. That's possible, but then again, you know, would there be records of him being in Cambridge at some some time interval, and there'd be he'd have firsthand knowledge of things like around Cambridge, he'd have knowledge of people that he worked with or was there with, mm -hmm. you know, and then some people say, oh, I can't remember any of my teachers or any of my professors from college and this and that. I was like, you don't remember your academic advisor? Like, if you're in a you know program like this, I, this I can remember all my teachers from high school. Like, I ran into one yesterday, actually. <laughs> You know? you know, you're it's the thing about him is he doesn't smell it like he passes the sniff test. He doesn't appear to be he doesn't appear to be a liar. He right. doesn't uh, he doesn't if he's playing a part as a character, he's got it nailed. If man, he is he's a liar, like, you know he's obvious. I mean? Yeah, like everyone. If says, I was going to cast him in the in, in, as a role in the movie, man, he he'd be a great uh, character for, to play the part for sure, man. He he does a great job at that, and and he had me fooled for a number of years, man. When I, I used to I used to argue in favor of Bob Lazar until I got you know smartened up and educated by real Area Fifty One and real physicists and real scientists, and you know got deep down the rabbit hole on all this propulsion stuff, man, because. You know, if you think Bob Lazar is the the epitome of where where this is this technology and this stuff is at, you haven't even scratched the surface. John Wheeler was a was a genius. He came up with all these different um, concepts and stuff. And one of the, two of the interesting things that he was working on specifically with Bryce Dewitt during this period in the 1960s, before physics got corrupted by string theory and sent off a cliff, they were working on on uh, uh, resolutions to um, the paradoxes between quantum mechanics and special and general relativity and special relativity like how do you merge relativity with quantum mechanics and make the two consistent and they were struggling to how to do that and one of the solutions that they came up with was this issue of quantum non-locality and that's this issue that the the substructure of space is on some higher dimensional plane that that space and time are, are actually like a, a holographic illusion and that everything exists all in one uh, hyperplane all at once and, and that we just see different things in different specs from different observer viewpoints and stuff a lot of this was confirmed you know years later by like elaine aspect and and um john bell and, uh, and others you know with some of their experiments but what, what, what that core argument of the quantum non-locality that's that explains right there how ufos are getting here because if you can create an einstein rosen bridge between these two points in the universe um, you can open a wormhole and then just, you know, step through. But then mm. how do you, how do you do that? How, how do you do that is another story. What, I'm sorry. I got to, this is, I'm just dumb. So I got to, I don't know what Einstein Rosen bridge is. <laughs> yeah. So this Einstein Rosen bridge. So they kind of came up with this idea of solutions to Einstein's field equations and um, a bunch of these, you know, a bunch of people come up with different metrics and different uh, solutions. So one, one of the most popular is the Schwarzschild. Um, metric, which is what, what black holes do. That's how. Uh, that's, right. That's like the 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 topology and um, physics of black holes is this uh, Schwarzschild solution. Now these other um, 
so the, these Einstein Rosen solutions are you know wormhole solutions. So okay. they're, they're they're solutions to the the field equations where you can open up two point and connect two points of space over over right, these like distances. folding a piece of paper in half and poking a hole right through it. Yes, okay. it's all about how you fold uh, folding the paper and then how you poke the hole. So the 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 opening and the shape of the the hole that you poke and um, all that is super important um, to doing that. Um, and this bending and folding of space time, but how do you do that? So the way way we can see it being done um, in physics is that the photons themselves are are actually generating and building and producing the space time. So so rather than thinking of relativity as this you know absolute theory, think of it as a um, emergent theory that's generated or comes out of quantum mechanics. And uh, one of the guys I like, he does a lot of cool research into this as is, is, uh, Lewis Kaufman. He's a mathematician. He does a lot of knot theory and shows how, you know, he has this whole paper on how relativity can emerge simply from, you know, quantum mechanics and the, these simple functions. If you just do this expansion and then you separate the odd and even terms, you get relativity from that as, as these two parts. And mm. uh, it's, it's an interesting take on, on the whole physics of it. Uh, because it's saying that if we, you know, when you shine light, that light is 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 creating an instantaneous. It's it's building the space time. The light itself is building the space time, and it's creating the these uh, Einstein Rosen bridges between every point that, that these interactions happen. So, if you were able to connect these, how do you connect two point distant points in space time? Is you'd have to have a lot of light going between those two points. That that's you know going back and forth or or, or focused. Um, and um, I got kind of got in this on Brett's channel a little bit because he was like, you know, making the the relativity argument for why aliens can't get here that we've all all heard. The speed of light is the speed limit. You can't go faster. Right. And that. But, speed of light would take, I think, what was he saying? It would take 100,000 years to right. get here from somewhere. But how long does it take for the photon? Because for the photon, it's instantaneous. Why Pho is that? The photon does not experience any time at all. In fact, the photon makes the trip, goes backwards, and then ne to negotiate, and then goes backwards in time, and then and then then figures out which what, which route it's going to take, according to QED, which is quantum electrodynamics, the the theory of light, as as written out by Richard Feynman, which is which is super interesting. That's like this pilot this pilot it was the pilot wave theory. It's one interpretation of quantum mechanics. There's two different interpretations. Um, one is this pilot wave interpretation that's Bohmian quantum mechanics and the other one is um copenhagen interpretation that's the schrodinger's cat where it's both alive and dead at the same time in the state of superposition before the wave function collapses rather than it takes the trip renegotiates and then figures out which way it's going to go that's kind of a different approach to, to the, the the quantum action the principle of quantum action mm. um but this whole idea is that for the photon and, and light, it seems, has a lot to do with, with all this. Because I mentioned in order to create anti-gravity, you need negative mass. So how right. do you create negative mass? Right. Well, they've done it experimentally. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah, there's, there's an experiment that they did at University of Rochester where they created negative mass in a laboratory. And they did it using uh, something called polariton condensate. Now, what the hell is polariton condensate? Well... It's liquid light is another word for it. It's light that's been trapped inside of a material. So when light goes in a material, it produces these qua these um, you know quasi particles inside the material by the, the interaction of the electromagnetic fields to the material. Those are called excitons. And when the excitons are large enough to polarize the actual you know physics inside there, the, the vacuum, you can actually create these polaritons or you know, Polar, this polarons and bipolarons and th these are all quasi particles that you can basically generate in materials and uh, through these generation of these quasi particles you can create systems where negative mass can be produced through these polariton condensates which is liquid light it's trapped light so it's fascinating because you see these you know ufos that like appear like glowing balls of light and then they do this warp thing you know and how are they doing that? And is there any, you know, interest, you know, is there any physics behind this? And well, sure enough, light can produce propulsion. You know, there's a number of, you know, we, I, I mentioned the radiometer, Crook, Crook's radiometer. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a meter which measures radiation or, or, or the uh, Crook's radiometer. Yeah. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, 
This was what you showed me in the Giza power plant book in Christopher Dunn's book. No, that was the Crooks tube. That's Crooks an electron tube. gun. So, so okay. yeah, that was, remember uh, Joe Rogan had um, Tom DeLong on the podcast and he's talking about this, you know, meta material that they have that they use to warp space time. And he's saying, oh, they fire an electron at it and it goes slower, you know, one way than the other. And, um, you know, Joe Rogan was like, how do you fire an electron at it? And, and Tom DeLong's like, I don't know. I'm not a physicist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the answer is a Crooks tube. That's a an electron. Crooks tube. That's an electron an elect gun. It's an electron gun. Yeah. So that's, that's what you could, that's what you could have used to fire electrons, but this is a little different. So electron, th these are photons. These are light particles and light particles actually, you know, contain mass or, or they contain momentum because you can get that you can get this thing spinning just by shining light on it. And it's just black squares on one side and white on the other. So what happens on the white side is it's reflecting the light and on the black side, it's absorbing the light. Right. So it gets a, there's an in, in, imbalance in the forces from the light, um, the pressure that the light puts on there. So, oh, so wow. it actually, that's what causes the thing to, to spin or rotate. Cause you know how they get the black on one side and the white on yes. the other. So that's, that's the principal concept behind this. So light has momentum. So you can use light to push things. So if you get enough light, you can push heavy. Th I mean, this is really light, perfectly balanced thing. And, and, you know, you're using a small amount of light, but it can still push it. It's, but what happens when you get a ton of light and you bounce it around inside this resonant cavity, you know, in this meta material that you've created that is made to capture and trap light. It's essentially a, a, a piece of glass or a dielectric between two mirrors. So that the mirrors just bounce the light back and forth between the glass you know, in the middle. So the light, light goes in and they're one way mirrors. So you can, the light goes in and then it gets trapped and you can bounce it around and then you can do different things to that light. You can squeeze it and then you can set up other, um, you know, Zenic surface waves and other, other types of waves in, in the uh, structure to produce these different types of condensates. So, uh, con condensates are condensed matter physics. So it's not like condensed milk where I'm, you know, evaporating all the water out. It, it's, it's, where I'm cooling all the quantum particles so that the statistics that govern them all fall to the same level so that they start behaving, you know, their quantum mechanical behaviors start emer becoming more emergent. So you're creating, you know, macroscopic objects that are uh, exhibiting quantum mechanical behaviors. That's how, you know, you can, there might be a window into how to, you know, change physics altogether. And I, if they're not working on this, then they should be. And um, I don't think they would have figured this out in the 1950s. I don't think they had the math or the material science back in the 50s. Assuming that we captured actual pieces of, you know, UFOs or fly extraterrestrial technology, we might have, you know, had some of this and maybe back engineered or learned something from studying those pieces. But as far as, you know, us being able to build them and manufacturing them, I don't think we're at that level yet. I think that that's where the, the problem is right now in, in the... In the um, in the whole industry of being able to do this. You know, that's why I'm not worried about talking about this kind of stuff. I don't think, you know, Russia and China, it would need a, you need a, a very large state apparatus to be able to fund a program and, and research something like that. It could be aliens flying out there, but then again, you know, they have the technology to get here. Why are they using their invisibility cloaks? Because metamaterials and invisibility cloaking and carbon nanotubes that you, uh, all those types of technologies you can produce invisibility with we've done it look up mirage, mirage effect um look up mirage effect cnt's cnt is short for carbon it's incredible nanotube. we can find all this stuff right on google yeah if you know what to look for <laughs> If you know what to look for. Right. Yeah. You got to know what to look for. That's you for have sure. to know the keywords. And if you don't, then you will never, ever stumble across it in your random researches, right. you know, not in a million years. But if you know what you're looking for, yeah, it will come right up. Absolutely. So they have a sheet of carbon nanotubes and they run a voltage through it and it creates a mirage effect, which bends the light around. It. So. Whoa. That's way easier than a warp drive, bro. So if you got warp drive, you can you can invisible you got visibility cloaks, bro. This is underwater. Yeah, it's in a, it's underwater actually. So explain to me how this is happening. So what happens, right, is they run a voltage through those carbon nanotubes, which are like, what's a carbon nanotube? Uh, so like, think of like graphene, you know, almost like a super, almost like a real, real, almost like a superconductor, but not quite a superconductor. So it's real high. Um, 
ele really low electrical resistance in these okay. things. Then when a high voltage through it, 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 it produces a massive amount of heat locally very quickly. So, so it's, it's heating up to like, like maybe, uh, I don't know, like four or 5,000 degrees at, 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 a, at a very small point on the surface of that. And mm -hmm. that temperature inversion creates a, um, creates a warping of the space. And this happens actually, uh, you ever heard of Fata Morgana? No. So type in F-A-T-A -A Morgana. So a Fata Morgana is a, another type of mirage. It's called the Flying Dutchman. Because it it's where like ships will appear to be floating um, slightly above the, the surface of the water. Okay, yeah. And that's caused by you see that graph the the the, the color the red the reddish one the reddish picture that's the one yeah oh you get a bigger you got to get a bigger version of that there has to be a a bed of of really hot air on top of a bed of of, of cold air and that that um see the the super hot air and that layer between the hot air and the cold air is yes. where that refractive index is key and the refractive index is key because when when that refractive index changes rapidly there's a reflection off there so so you're actually getting a reflection off of that temperature gradient same way that you're getting a reflection of the mirage off the temperature gradient in those carbon nanotubes so it's um that's I'm how invisibility right works now. that's how invisibility works man we <laughs> you are blowing my fucking mind um <laughs> our ice melted i gotta get us uh, some more ice well let's let's don't pause just keep running it i'm gonna go grab some ice it's gonna about to get real deep i'm gonna need here, to wet my so. whistle if we're gonna get deeper than this Right, so so the same idea. You have a surface of hot air or a hot, um, a hot, the temperature gradient creates a a um, an inversion effect where you have a, um, a refractive index, mm -hmm. and that's the same effect that you look at the hot road on a hot sunny day, and you get that mirage effect looking down. Right, the road. exactly. Same thing in a desert. You see that when you look at like a yeah. telephoto shot of a desert, you can see it when people are walking it's down the, the road. The surface of the sand or the road is hotter than the surrounding air. Right, because the sun's right there, and that that um, temperature gradient um, or layering effect creates it creates. This. So, is there any proof that this is actually being used in defense research or any kind of like technology bigger than something in a fishbowl. Yeah, well, there's so they started the 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 again I mentioned the Project Rainbow is the US um invisibility project started by Edward Mills Purcell. Project Rainbow. So you can search Project Rainbow, see. So right. And they created with a number of uh interesting technologies. Like one of them was uh this is where the metamaterials first uh, kind of got their background. So <laughs> yeah, you're not maybe not get it for that, but uh look up um <laughs> wallpaper project rainbow wallpaper for example right so they have this stuff called the wallpaper oh no 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 <laughs> no, no no so they they created a grid and they printed on it like a grid uh, with um on the wallpaper and the and the grid was like a meta material that was tuned to the same frequency as the russian radar the or the, the radar systems they were trying to be invisible against and by coating the U2s with the fuselage of the U2 with this this uh, wallpaper stuff, they were able to make it um, invisible. And this was like a very early version. It was very, of course, it was very thick and heavy, and it created too much drag and other other problems for the craft to really be usable and effective. Um, but that was like the big thing because you know they started the russians were tracking our u2 flights as you know as early as the 50s and right. so we were trying to figure out how to how we can get these these programs to go over and this was lockheed that made this yeah uh maybe developed by the yeah. lincoln lab team at lockheed yep yeah it was lockheed yeah so so then they had some of these other um ideas for for how to how to do it um including the yeah the trapeze um reflectors and stuff um but eventually this uh this stuff developed into a study on you know ma materials themselves so it's so actually the paint the, the black paint that they use on the sr-71 which replaced the u2 for as, as a recon plane um, and also the paint that's on the f-117 it's this black very uh dull black paint right it's yeah, actually brett was talking about this when you guys were on when you were on his show yeah briefly yeah so they they actually figured out it's made out of barium titanate um a version of barium titanate and uh the, which is a ferroelectric and it has an interesting radar response so they use this paint with a uh, metamaterials built into the paint to make it more radar absorbent 
And um, they burned a bunch of this stuff out at uh, because they have to replace, they have to scrape off and replace the paint very often because it's it's very uh, susceptible to weather and other, mm -hmm. other things. Um, the, in order to keep it fresh, they, they cost a ton of money to maintain and, and this, you know to, to repaint these these things and do it. And also the toxicity of disposing of this stuff. They were burning in open burn pits out at Area 51, and a bunch of guards got sick. You can look up a case of the guy. The guy's name is Fred Dunham. And he's uh, one of the guards that got like super sick uh, from these open burn pits. So they were actually, you know, burning the stuff and people were breathing in and getting sick mm. out there uh, as a way to dispose of the technology supposedly so that, you know, it wouldn't get out. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's some, there is evidence of them using this. Yes. And, and on active craft. Oh, well, there it is. <laughs> and there's, is there any, like, has there ever been any footage of, what we saw on those little tubes inside the water of basically the thing becoming invisible. Oh, of like, at, well, like, a, like this cloaking technology. So if you look up, um, look up BAE stealth tanks. So they have these polychromatic, this is the earlier version of this, this is a, a very, a, a different version. So they use these polychromatic B hexagon panels. BAE is what? BAE is British Aerospace okay. uh, or something like that. It's BAE. Uh, right. It used to be Marconi. Believe it or not. Look at that tank. Look at the look, click on the one with the guy standing next to it. Right, right there. Holy shit. Look at that thing, dude. It's like a Tesla tank. Yeah. So the those those hexagon panels on the side of it can uh, change the color and all they can also they they change color to make it like uh, visual camouflage, but they they can also change heat signature with infrared. So look at that that uh, image with where the tank is in the infrared the infrared one um in the middle on the bottom. Oh, right, right there, there, yeah. So that's the tank, and then it, it activates the panels, and it looks like an SUV out there from the heat signature because it, it it changes it cools the the other panels and and heats the other ones up. Oh wow. Um. Yes, yeah, so it's. I don't know what BAE actually stands for. I thought it stood for like British Aerospace. It's like the, it's like the British but... version of Lockheed or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you know where Britain's Area 51 is? No. Porton Down. What's the significance that's, of Porton Down? Porton Down is where the Area 51, that's Britain's Area 51. That's oh, okay. where they do all their classified, you know, aerospace and physics research. What, and stuff. what country, what country do you think has the most sophisticated U.S. No, definitely. U.S. Yeah, we, we definitely, definitely have the other countries be. I don't know what it crashed at Roswell, but I don't think it was you have a theory? Um, Project Mogul. I don't think it was Project Mogul weather balloon uh, train. Right. You know, the Alvarez, uh, you know, explanation. And, right. That and was that. a cover up, right? Where they had the guy take the photo, but posing with that piece of like foil. Saying there it was, was a weather balloon both, for the news. Go, both the guys in that photo. So Jesse Marcel and Colonel DeBeau both testified to a material switch and they said that that was not the material and that they, they they faked that photo op and they did a material switch so both the top intelligence officers right there testified to that numerous people who handled the material described it in in you mm -hmm. know the great yeah. detail um yeah that's a piece of radar target and everything and uh you know weather balloon with radar target so that's you know, you can see the look on disappointment on Marcel's face, like almost like he's being forced to do this and he knows something more. Mm -hmm. And even Jesse Marcel's son said his, he, he stopped at the house on the way home and showed his son some of the material. Right. Said he saw it too. He said it, it looked like this crystallized stuff and, you know, this uh, in Bakelite material or something. But, it was, you know, so the materials that were described by all these witnesses who saw it was not a weather balloon. It's just hard to believe that it was mistaken by air force intelligence for a weather balloon that, you know, they, they would make this mistake and then have to fly it out to Fort Worth. Could you imagine like the air force intelligence getting into Fort Worth and being like, Oh, it's a weather balloon. You thought it was a, you thought it was an alien spaceship. Right. You know, so I just, there's certain things that don't make sense. I, I believe that if it was an alien spaceship, the government completely had the ability to cover it up. They they still do to this day. It, it the, with what I've seen that their ability to cover other things up, um, I just cannot possibly believe that they couldn't cover something like that up if it were true. Um, there's so many people from Wright Patterson that reported you know handling this material or working on it. Then you have the Battelle study that was done in 1949 looking into nickel titanium alloys, 
they developed a whole system of you know dissolving these uh, alloys of unknown origin uh, using uh, carb uh, chlorine tetra tetrachloride. So they dissolve it in chlorine and then measure the off gases of the, as they as they burn it in, in chlorine and dissolve it in chlorine and then burn it. And they measure the off gases to tell what the thing was made out of. Mm. So why would this was a, a, a you know a Battelle document? You know, the, written for Wright Patterson Air Force Base in 1949, and the scientist who wrote it, um, Elroy John Center, testified that you know he worked on he was given materials while working at Battelle. He was given metals that he thought were from aliens because he didn't he didn't think we could make that kind of stuff. It was impossible. The, the stuff that he had worked on. He told his wife this, and he told other people mm. this. <clears throat> so. Um, it's super interesting. Then the director of Battelle was this guy Howard Cross, who it turns out was um, you know connected with with some interesting research into all this. And then you know NASA doing research into the into the, these um, shape retention alloys as well. Um, the fact that they were looking into specifically nickel titanium alloys and um, and trying to you know figure out this stuff that early just shows me that there there's there might be something to this. They have this you know we we created the first memory metal based on this technology and then we're working on it right after this and the, and these all these witnesses are describing this foil, which sounds a lot like a sophisticated memory material. Now I've heard that it's a, like a nitinol wire, a fine you know thread of nitinol wire that's woven in a fabric that's actually how this some of this stuff is made and that's why it has the, these you know materials that it does that it's like woven on the atomic level and that's why mm. they looked at it under an sem and were like how the hell we're we gonna make this dude you know like you need a like a micro loom or something to, to right. weave this or you know so um, it can just imagine that that you know the complexity of these nanomaterials when they looked at them and were like how can we, you know, build this stuff? And what's even going on here as far as the physics goes? Because, you know, you, you dive into all this polariton and exciton stuff where you're, you're you're trapping light inside these cavities, and then mm -hmm. you can then you can do things with the light once you once you have it trapped, and you and you can you can build integrated photonic circuits. So you can build entire circuit boards of integrated electronics that function on photons instead of electrons. So they're much more efficient. You know, when you deal with electrons, you have resistivity and impedance. So, so you're, you're burning most of your energy that you're using to do your calculations on your computer and, and do everything on your computer. You, most of that energy is getting wasted as heat. But if you had it all in, in terms of light instead of electrons and electronics, if you had it with photonics and spintronics of just, you know, these microscopic, I mean, I mean nanotechnology engineered materials that would you know, can trap and redirect light through all these channels the same way that your computer does it with voltage and current and inside these integrated circuit boards. You could build, you know, very advanced computers that are, you know, and the storage capabilities that you'd have, like 5D crystal storage. You know, it would just be, you know, this is this is the world we're going towards and you can't get smaller than building atom by atom, you know. So that's, if you're talking about alien technology, that's, that's the crux. I mean, that's where you're, where eventually you need to get to is the ability to manufacture things atom by atom and what we're going to be able to do with nanotechnology once we get to that, you know, level. It, it just shows that they knew it was computers and they knew they needed to figure out computers and integrated circuits and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th that's the thing, like guys like the day after Roswell with Corso, he says that, oh, all our integrated computer chips and all this stuff came right from Roswell and stuff. And it shows that they were, they were working on this stuff. This stuff's existed before Roswell, man. I mean, they had vacuum tubes. They, they were working on the transistor, you know, even though it was vent, invented after Roswell, I don't think it came from Roswell because the guys who were working on it, like had all the solid state theory behind it. And they, mm -hmm. it, it, all the physics was there. It didn't like come from nowhere and it can all be traceable to human scientists and human sources. And that's another thing I don't like in all this because a lot of times the aliens get the credit for all these discoveries of this stuff. And it's like, no, you're missing all the history and the, and the real science and the, and the people who worked on this. And there's people that spent their lives to get the science of this to this point. And, and you're going to give, you're going to credit aliens for everything.